everybody. Welcome to our live crochet event. I'm Brenda KB Anderson, and I'm super excited today to show you how to make the Sunray bucket hat, which is this hat here. Super cute. It's a great hat for summertime because it lets all those breezes through. It's very lightweight, um, and it's made out of raffia. So if you've never used raffia before, um, this is a good time to try because this project is pretty simple, very straightforward. A lot of it, actually, this whole section is made in single crochet in the round, and then the brim is made in um, sort of a version of a half double crochet stitch. There's just one little, uh, a different place where you put your hook for that. And I'll, sh I'll be showing you all the different stitches you need to know, um, as well as talking our way through this hat. Um, so this is, of course, a live event. So if you have questions for me during the event, please put them in the chat box. I'd love to hear from you. Um, you know, if you just want to say hi, tell me where you're crocheting from. Um, or, you know, of course, if you have any questions, need clarification, please let me know because I'll be addressing those while I'm working here. So um, let's first start by talking about the raffia. So if you've never crocheted with raffia before, um, one sort of tricky thing about raffia is that there's absolutely no elasticity whatsoever. So it's kind of like imagine crocheting with something in between a twine and a very thin rolled up piece of very sturdy paper. <laughs> it's kind of what it feels like in your hands. This particular raffia that I chose is very thin. Um, it's, it's more of a twine shape. It's slightly flattened, but it's, it's um, a slightly rounder shape than what I've seen in a lot of other places, this type of raffia. I just brought this for um, comparison. So this, this type of raffia is more like a ribbon shape, and um, it's very thin, very, very flat in one direction, and maybe about a quarter of an inch a little bit less than that, um, wide. So you could, if this is the kind of raffia you end up finding or you already have some, you can substitute with this, but it is going to give you a larger gauge. So if you are, if you want to follow the pattern word for word all the way through and not do any modifications, then try to find something that's going to give you the correct gauge. Um, it, it, if you can't find a raffia like this, um, and actually I should mention too, I, I did put a link in the pattern so you can see exactly where I bought the raffia from. Um, I bought mine on Amazon, uh, but that way you can see exactly what it looks like. You can see a close up of what this, what this is and um, the information about it. There's information in your pattern about it too. So if you're looking for substitutions, that should help you. I did actually do a couple of swatches in cotton because I thought that might be a common question that people might have if you could substitute with something that isn't raffia because the raffia is a little bit, it, it can be kind of hard on your hands. It's, it's very inelastic, so some people might find it challenging. Um, you just have to go a little slower and, you know, it's not, it's not that it's hard to do, it's just that it takes, you have to slow down, basically. Um, and if you don't have patience for that, I don't blame you. <laughs> uh, so I did do a couple of swatches up in a cotton. This cotton is from a big box store. It's very, a very common weight. It's a CYCA number four worsted weight cotton. And I did a, sam uh, a swatch of that and it's ending up a little bit bigger than I would like it to be to match my gauge. It doesn't quite match my gauge. It's about one round off. So. I will be talking about how to modify your hat on the way through as we're working through our steps in case this is something that you choose. So, and I did another sample in another, it's also a CYCA number four dishcloth cotton. This one was left over from my pineapple water sling pattern. I don't know if you guys joined me uh, a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, maybe more than that now. Um, I did a tutorial, live tutorial on a making your own water bottle sling. And so this was some leftover yarn from that. So you can look up exactly what I used there if you are interested. But this was giving me a very close gauge to the raffia. So if you end up switching to a cotton, your hat is not going to be quite as stiff. See, this is a little bit floppy here. So your bucket hat, I mean, it'll still look like a bucket hat. But if you really, really want the brim of it to flare out and be very stiff, you're going to have to use millinery wire or something in the edge of the hat to make it really stand out and not kind of wave back and forth a little bit. Um, but, or you could try, another thing you could try, I didn't do a sample of this, but you can try crocheting extremely tightly by adding a second 
ball of the same yarn just for the brim and crocheting them both together with the same size hook or maybe slightly above to see if you like that fabric because if you crochet very tightly with the cotton yarn it will be stiff enough so those are just some ideas because I knew that you know this is a very specific yarn usually I don't like to make my live patterns with a very specific yarn that isn't easy to swap you know for other things but um, I really wanted to make a raffia hat. So <laughs> they all are so different. All the raffia yarns that I've found are so different from each other. I just wanted to kind of give you a heads up um, if you're looking for a substitution or if you can't find what I used. All right, so Sarah is wondering if there's different colors of the raffia. Yes, this particular kind um, that I ordered, there was probably like 20, I don't know, something around 20 different colors. There was, I, used a, I purchased a red. There's a, like a lighter tan version of this. Um, there's light blue, there was purple, I can't remember. But there's quite a few different colors. That's part of the reason that I chose this raffia because I thought it'd be fun to mix it up and try some other colors too. So thank you for that question. Um, oh, and hi to Teresa from Portugal. That's exciting. And Robin has a question. Do you suppose that you could use linen in place of the raffia? I have some in my stash that I would love to use up. I think linen would make a good substitute. I think, um, so Robin, I think that if you're gonna substitute with your linen, you might end up, I mean, it, it might be hard to get the exact same gauge, but it might be dead on. I mean, I have no idea how thick your linen is, um, but it's definitely, it would, it would be a really good, feel to the fabric. It would be probably even more stiff than, than the cotton yarn that I used, which would be nice for this hat. So I would say go for it, make a gauge swatch, and hopefully um, watching this tutorial will help you if your gauge isn't exactly dead on, you'll know what to do to make your hat turn out the right size. So, all right, I say go for it. So we've talked about the yarn, let's talk about other materials you're gonna need. You're gonna need a yarn needle, a pair of scissors, and you're gonna need six, six stitch markers Preferably one of those stitch markers should be something that looks different than the other ones. So you can keep track at the beginning of your round so you can distinguish that one stitch marker from the others. If all of your stitch markers are identical, you could use something else like a bobby pin or just some other something to um, designate the first stitch of the round. And let's see. Okay, those are all your materials, so we're just going to get started. So we're going to begin by making a magic loop, also called an adjustable loop. Um, there's lots of different names for this and there's lots of different ways to make it too so you can make it your own preferred way this is how I like to make mine I just draw kind of like a little circle I make a little loop de loo and then I take this loop and I flip it over on top of right on top of the yarn that's connected to the ball and that's where I'm gonna slide my hook under so I put my hook under that and I just pull this a little bit tighter so it's a little more manageable and then I do one chain right here, chain one, and that kind of anchors it to my loop. Then we are going to start, oh, I forgot to mention, we need a crochet hook for this project. <laughs> that would be, uh, I am using an F 3.75 millimeters. That would be a sad day to not have a crochet hook for this project. You're gonna have a hard time doing this with your fingers. So yes, the, the size I'm using is an F, 3.75 millimeters, but you, you will use whatever you need to to get a gauge that's as close to mine as you can get. All right, so we're gonna start crocheting right into that loop. We're gonna do six single crochets. So a single crochet is you insert your hook, you're gonna yarn over, pull up a loop, yarn over and pull through two. That's the first single crochet. We're going to do that five more times. Insert, yarn over, pull up a loop, yarn over, pull through two. Four more times. Insert, yarn over, pull up, yarn over, pull through two. All right, and we'll do three more. One, two, three. So I should mention too, if you're switching out the raffia for different raffia, particularly if your raffia can be broken, if you can just do this and break your raffia, which you cannot with this, that's part of the reason I chose this, um, so that you wouldn't be getting frustrated with your raffia breaking. If you are using a raffia that does break easily, then I would make this first loop uh, start out with a, a th piece of thread or yarn or something. Just tie a little knot with a loop so you can start working through there um, and be able to pull it tight. 
so that way you don't break your raffia because at this point you're putting a lot of tension on it because it's kind of sticky it's not as slidey as yarn and you might you probably will break that if you're using um, one of those sort of papery flat raffias okay so the next round we're going to put two single crochets into each stitch around so we're going to count backwards to find our first stitch so one two three four five six we're starting with this stitch right here we're going to insert our hook underneath that stitch and this first round is a little tricky because um, your stitches will loosen up a little bit as you work a little further along but on this first round it is a little bit hard to get your crochet hook through there so for that reason actually i would recommend using a metal crochet hook or especially a metal hook with an ergonomic handle would be the perfect thing for this project because it can be a little tiring on your hands, like I said, but you do need the stiffness of that metal to be able to poke your crochet hook through, especially for this first round. It was a little bit tight. And hello to Victoria from Southport, Maine. And uh, let's see, Barbiaro, Barbara. Babario, I'm not. I'm sorry. I, I completely butchered your name. Um, they're from Canada, and they are appreciating this tutorial. Thank you so much. And with, yes, with the hand pain, you're going to want to try cotton or something else. Yes. All right. I'm just continuing around, making two stitches into each stitch around, and we're going to, at the end of this round, we're going to pop a stitch marker in the first stitch, just so that we don't have to keep track of where that is. Let's see. Two, four, six, eight, ten. 11 stitches and here's my 12. Okay. All right. So on the third round, actually this would be a good time for me to explain if you're a little bit newer to working on uh, working from a pattern from a written pattern, I want to explain to you how this works. When you read we're working on uh, round three next, so this is round three. And when you read a pattern and it has brackets like this, what that means is everything inside those brackets, that section is what you do whatever this says. So it's like compiling one little piece of information and saying, you're going to do this six times. So this would be two single crochets into the next stitch and then single crochet into the next stitch. So we're gonna do two in the next, one in the following, and then we repeat that little section a total of six times. All right, so we're gonna do two single crochets here, one, and we're putting a stitch marker in there. One and two. Okay, Becky has a question. What happens when the raffia hat gets wet in a rainstorm? That's a good question. Okay, so I was curious about that too. So after I crocheted a little sample of this, I put it underwater for a little while, maybe like five minutes. Um, and then I took it out and it was damp for a while. It took a little while to dry, but it didn't fall apart or anything like that. But the, this particular raffia, this seems different than the other raffi raffias that I'd, I've used, those papery thin ones. If you're substituting with a different raffia, I, I don't know. I don't think it's going to just disintegrate. I think you can still get that raffia a little bit wet. Like if it's a light rain, but like a super soaking downpour, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe your hat would survive that, but this particular raffia, yeah, I'm pretty sure you could probably throw it in water and pull it out and it would probably be fine. I do recommend um, in this pattern not to soak it, not to, especially because, you know, most of the time when we block things, we soak them. I do recommend not to soak it because I am just a little bit worried that someone will forget and soak it for too long or maybe it'll behave a little differently for someone else with a different water temperature. I don't know. But it's definitely okay to get a little bit wet. Um, you know, it's okay to, ha to be out in a shower and it'll, like, you know, a shower or maybe like even a thunderstorm for a few minutes. <laughs> but I wouldn't test it by, definitely don't throw it into your washing machine. That would be a bad idea. I would hate for somebody's hat to fall apart, especially after all that work. Okay, and Karen is wondering what type of yarn this is. So this is a raffia, a raffia yarn. It's about two millimeter. It's, it's a very thin, more like a twine shape, not a flat shape of raffia like this. This is what 
I've seen a lot of this sort of flat, papery raffia. The yarn that I'm using is raffia, but it seems a little sturdier and um, definitely held up a little bit better with a little bit of water on it too. So that's part of the reason that I chose this. I just wanted it to be a really durable hat. Um, and if you, you can always go back and watch the beginning of this tutorial later so you can find out a little bit more about the yarn and a little bit more about some substitutions too that we talked about earlier. All right, so right now I'm still working on round three. I'm doing two single crochets and one stitch, one single crochet in the next stitch. And we're almost around. The last two stitches here, two in this one and one in the last one here. Okay, so that's round three. And then round four is single crochet into the next two stitches, then two single crochets into the next stitch. So we're gonna do uh, one single crochet and then another single crochet, each into their own stitches, one, two, and then the next stitch we're gonna do two single crochets in that one two and one. So this would be one, one, two, and we'll just uh, repeat that around. One, one, two. So what we're really doing here, if you've crocheted a lot, you probably recognize this, we're just making a flat circle of single crochet in the round. And we're gonna continue working on this flat circle uh, until it's about three to four inches smaller than the circumference, than, than you want the finished circumference. Um, so the finished circumference, I mentioned in the pattern, the finished circumference, I took that from right here on the hat, just above where the brim starts. So that is the part that's, um, you know, it's the widest from this section before the brim flares out. And that's what will be touching your head right here. So you will want to measure that area. If you're, if you're trying to alter this uh, to fit you and your gauge is not correct, you're just going to keep making this circle until it gets to be about three to four inches. I would err on the side of three if you're not sure, because you can always add more stitches. Smaller than... Um, or actually four, actually aim for three and a half, just do it in the middle of those two if you're not really sure, but about three to four inches smaller than the circumference that you want it to be because after, um, after that we're going to be slowing down our increases a lot. So, you know, we will still be increasing, but it's going to start making that, you know, downward slope of the bucket hat shape. Let's see, where are we? One, two, one. One, one, two. Okay, let me count my stitches. I think I might have missed one here while I was talking. Let's see if we have, uh, this is round four, so we should have 24 stitches. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Oops, I increased one too many right here. So, you know, it doesn't, <laughs> this is a good time to point out that it doesn't really matter exactly where you put these increases. I like to write my patterns so that the increase is in a different section every time you go around so you're not stacking increases right on top of each other because when you do that, you start to get a visual line of where your increases are. And I, for most of my designs, I don't really like to have that there unless it adds something, some kind of design element to it. So that's why I write it all out for a while. Um, and then usually what I end up doing is I will put some stitch markers in and just say increase once between the stitch markers so you, have, you can stop all this count, counting nonsense. Um, but if you are working on this and you really like to have those increase lines or you just always want to make your increase um, right at the beginning of each of those six sections around, you can do, totally do this your own way. It doesn't have to be in the same spot that I'm putting it in, um, in the pattern. If you want to go off 
you know, and do your own thing, that's totally fine, of course, because this is crochet and you're in charge. All right, so then in round five and six and seven, we're just continuing to do the same thing. We're working what's in those brackets six times around, and so we're increasing for the next three rounds um, by six inches, or by six stitches, I should say, not six inches, because that would be crazy, six stitches on each round. So round seven looks like this. Um, and then after that, we're going to, we're continuing to do the same amount of increases, but I just switch how I tell you to do them. So like I was saying before, I usually just add a bunch of stitch markers in there and tell you to increase between your stitch markers so you can stop counting. So that is what we're doing in this round. So round eight, we're going to be placing six, six stitch markers. The first one goes in the first stitch of the round, and that one needs to be a contrasting marker. So we're working a single crochet into the, each of the next six stitches, and then two single crochets into the following stitch. So that means we're going to start with six single crochets, one into each stitch. There's the first one. And I'm going to use, I'm going to do this in rainbow order. Um, red will be my beginning color. And then actually, make, maybe I'll make the rest of them purple so it stands out a little more. So I have five more stitch markers that are in a different color. This is my beginning. So one, two, three. Let's see. I have another question from Brenda. Brenda. Um, she's wondering, what about using a thin macrame cord? Would that work too? You know, I haven't used I haven't used macrame cord that's this thin, but I don't know that much about macrame. So if you think it's this, it could, does it, if it looks kind of like this, then sure. Or just do a little swatch and see how that's going to work out. And if you're more adventurous about changing the amount of um, rounds you repeat to alter your pattern a little bit, then I think that would work because that would be nice and stiff. Uh, your hat might be, it might be a little bit heavier. I mean, it's not, <laughs> it's not going to be like you can't lift your head or anything, but um, it might not be quite as airy as, as this hat, but I mean, do a swatch and then you can feel what that fabric is like and then see if, you know, just try to imagine it as a hat and then see if you want to go on from there. Okay, so I've done three stitches. I'm going to do three more and then we're going to do an increase. One, two, three, and then here's two single crochets into the next stitch. So then we're going to repeat that and every time we repeat this, we put a new stitch marker in. Okay, so one new stitch marker. Two, three, four, five, six. Ooh, I got a little bit of a tangle here because I <laughs> I'm using this bowl for too many things. Sorry, bowl. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and then two single crochets into the next stitch. All right, and we're gonna repeat that again. One. Put a stitch marker in. Two, three, four, five, six, and then two single crochets into the next stitch. One, two, and then we're going to repeat that. One stitch marker, two, three, four, five, six, two single crochets, one and two, and then we're repeating again. One stitch marker, two, three, four, five, six, two single crochets, one and two. And then here's the last repeat. One, two, three, four, five, six, and two single crochets here, one and two. Okay, so now at this point, 
you're just going to continue working your way around and every time every every section between markers will get one increase so that means you single crochet along but somewhere in there you put two single crochets into one of those stitches between each marker so that way you know you're going to have six increases every time you go around and so this is the part that I like because you don't have to count you just go around and around and around and just make sure you're putting an increase somewhere now what I like to do is I like to, like I said before, I don't like my increases to be inside, you know, right, worked right into the top of another increase. So I will oftentimes just choose a place, like this time I'm going to do them kind of closer to the, to the beginning stitch marker. So I'm going to do them here maybe, here, 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 here. See how I'm putting my finger a little bit closer to that one stitch marker? And then the next round, I might put it on the other end. So I, if I did one here on this round, next round I would put one over here, 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 here. It's really, for me, it's just kind of eyeballing it. You can take a look at where you did them in the last round. They don't have to be in exactly the same place between each stitch, you know, each set of stitch markers. It's okay, you know, if you put an increase in maybe the third stitch after this marker, but you do it in the second stitch after this marker, it really doesn't matter that much. It's kind of more just about eyeballing it and trying to, these markers are there just to help you space your stitch markers out a little bit. So I don't know if I, I don't think I mentioned what I was doing here, but I took that first stitch and then I did a, um, an increase right there in that second one after that, after that stitch marker there. So because I did my increase pretty close after I did this, uh, this, after I single crocheted into the stitch marker space. So there's my stitch marker. And then I'm gonna do an increase right here. Okay, so I would continue doing that all the way around, just working your single crochets um, all the way around and putting an increase between each marker and depending on the size you make that will tell you how many rounds to do so you're just going to keep on going until your hat is about well until if you're following the pattern and you were able to get gauge you'll just you know you'll know how many rounds to do and how many stitches you should have at the end of the uh, at the end of that section but if you are working <laughs> if you didn't quite get the right gauge if you're kind of making something up here then you're going to have to just keep going until your circle measures about uh, three inches or so smaller than your your head circumference, three and a half inches or so smaller than what you want your intended size to be. So you would continue to work. Um, th this is right here, rounds nine through 11, that's for the smallest size, nine through 12, that's for the second size, nine through 13, that's for the size that I'm making. 9, 9 through 14, that's the largest size. So the size increments are being shown now in parentheses. So they will correspond to how many stitches you have, how many rounds you do, and that sort of thing. So you need to look for where your um, size is within those brackets. So let's see. OK, um, Sandra is asking, or Sandra is asking, what size head does this hat fit? So there's four different sizes. That's funny, because I was just sort of talking about that. Um, there's basically size child, which is about, um, let's see, an 18 inch head, 18, 20, 22, and 24 inch head measurements. So that's like your actual head, not the hat measurement, because the hat measurements are about an inch larger. So that almost never happens. I should point that out. Usually your hat measurement is the same or smaller than your head measurement because you want your hat to stretch a little, but because we're we're crocheting out of this raffia and there's virtually no stretch at all. Um, you're going to want this to be about an inch bigger than your head or, you know, at the very least, the same size as your head. You're just not, it, don't count on it stretching. <laughs> all right, so this is the section where um, we have landed, let's see, after we've worked through rounds 9 through 13, um, we've, we still have our stitch markers in here. One, two, three, four, five. So um, this is the very beginning. Let me make sure I have the right amount of stitches here. Looks like my stitch marker. Oh, okay. So at this point, after you've worked your circle, you're going to, you're going to remove the second. This is supposed to say third, which may, I don't know. I don't know if this has been corrected yet. Um, in 
the version that you have, but if you downloaded this right when it was available, you're, you're probably going to have to correct this. It should say second, third, fifth, and sixth. Okay, it used to say second, fourth, and fifth. That was incorrect. <laughs> um, it should say second, third, fifth, and sixth stitch markers. So we're, we're taking out everything except for the first two stitch markers. Here, I'm just going to work my way around. So I think that should be the first stitch. This, so this will be my first marked stitch. And we're going to, let's see, maybe we'll put that one in red. So we're removing basically these on the sides. We're just keeping the two that are opposite each other from the first stitch marker of the round, the beginning of the round, and the one directly opposite that. And we're getting rid of everything else. So the reason we're doing this is because we're changing, at this point, we're changing uh, our increasing pattern. Instead of doing six increases in the round, we are now going to only be doing two increases. So one increase on this side and one increase on this side between markers. So the same sort of theory applies here. If you do your increase about here, about that far after this first marker, you would do an increase over here. So if that is, you know, hard or confusing, you know, if that's confusing to you, what you can do, um, instead of counting your stitches, you can just choose every round, okay, I'm going to put my increase here, and I'm going to put my other increase here, and just decide that ahead of time and know that your, you know, these orange stitch markers mean where you're putting your increases. So you can just decide where they go, and they should be opposite each other. Up or sort of opposite each other. They don't have to be perfectly opposite. You don't have to count stitches or anything. But if you put them here on one round, on the next round, maybe you want to put them here. On the next round, you can put them here. So basically, you're just looking at it and trying to not put an increase into a not where another increase was or very close to where another increase was. You're just trying to spread them out. But every time you go around, you're just doing one single crochet in each stitch around, except for one of those stitches, you put two single crochets. So on this round, we're going to do them with the, where the orange stitch markers are. And so we would just crochet along until we get to those stitch markers and then put our two single crochets into that, into those markers and then remove them and then change it up for the next row. And hello to Deborah D. Thank you for joining. I, I love it that all of you guys are here with me while I'm working. It's so nice. Um, I'm starting to recognize some of the same names from the other lives that I've done, and that makes me feel good. Like, oh, hey, they came back. That's pretty awesome. But I also want to say, you know, if this is your first time here, I want you to feel very welcome, and I'm very, I'm always excited to teach crochet um, to new people too. <clears throat> All right, so I got to that stitch marker. Oops, I put it back in like I said I wasn't going to. And then you would just continue all around. This is just your halfway point. You're not putting an increase there. And then you'd put an increase here and continue around. So then on your next round, you just pick a different spot for those other two markers. Or you can just eyeball it. I, I don't even put stitch markers in. I just think, okay, I'm putting mine in the first third of the section. And then I can remember by the time I get over here, first third. But it's really up to you how, how much you want to pay attention to your work, how much you can remember. Um, but at least this way, you don't have to count your stitches. So you're going to continue working around and around and around. And you only do increases actually on every other round. So you are basically, you're doing two increases on one round. And then the next round, you're just working all the way around. So what you're essentially doing is you're doing one cre increase per round of the hat. So if that's easier for you to remember, you can just do that instead. You can just pick a spot on there and do an increase. The reason that I chose to do two increases and then the next round to not increase at all is because I was worried that we would end up with a very lopsided hat. It would be hard to make sure that you're putting them on both sides of the hat and spreading them out. You know, you might put one here and then you might put one here and then you might forget where your other one was and then you might put one here again and never get around to putting them on the opposite side. So. That's why I chose to do it two increases, and then the next round, no increases. So you're going to alternate between two increases and no increases for a while. And then your hat will look like this. And see how because we're, we went from increasing six around, which is a lot of increases, and that keeps your circle a flat circle, 
then all of a sudden we're doing fewer increases, so it starts to straighten out. So it's not, if I fold this like this, you can, still, you can see it's still increasing, it's still getting wider, but it is definitely a slower rate than it was before. So after you're finished with that section of the hat, and again, if you were not getting gauge, um, you should still be able to just increase, you know, two, two increases on one row, one increase on the next row, but you might be doing fewer or more repeats of that, those two rows um, until you get to, you know, where you can put it on your head and it'll be a little above your ears, somewhere on your forehead, about where you want the part of the hat that mostly goes straight down to stop. And at this point, we're going to start making this brim that flares out. So uh, to begin that, we're going to be working in half double crochet for one round. Let's see. This. OK, so right here, this hat is worked halfway through this round right here. It's round 26, 29, 32, and 35, depending on the round that you're, or depending on the size that you're making. So this is telling you to be putting a stitch marker in the first stitch of each, each increase in this round, and then you, you're removing any old markers that were still there. So basically, I think you're just removing one, that extra one marker. You're going to keep the beginning marker, which actually, let me show you. I already have, <clears throat> part of this round has already been worked. So right here, where my little sheep guy is, that was the very first increase. You can see... Right here, there are two half double crochet stitches going into that first stitch right there. And I'll show you how to work the half double crochet stitches in just a minute. So there's two half double crochet stitches there. We put the stitch marker in the first of those two stitches. Then we work 20 some, 30 some, let's see how many, a, a lot, 20 to 30, 26 to 34, depending on the size that you're making. You're working however many till you get to um, another third of the hat. So then you're doing two uh, half double crochet stitches into one stitch, an increase right here, putting a stitch marker in the very first of those two. And then you're working half double crochet stitches around to the last third. And then you're doing two half double crochets again, which is now I'm going to be showing you how to make the half double crochet stitches because we're on the very last third of this section. So let me clarify just a little further. If you have, if you are adjusting your stitch numbers and rounds and all that sort of stuff, at this point, basically what we're doing is we're just working a round of half double crochets and we're making three increases and they should be evenly spaced. So just take your total amount of stitches, whatever you had at that point, and then divide it by three and then subtract one from that. So you're whatever that number is, that's how many half double crochet stitches you're going to be stitching in between your increases. So th that should help a little bit because you may have ended up with a different amount of stitches just because, um, you know, you're trying to make things a little bigger or a little bit smaller if they didn't quite match gauge. You can ignore all of that if your gauge matched. Lucky you. All right, so here's a half double crochet stitch. Let me tuck this out of the way so we're not looking at that. All right, so you're going to yarn over, and then you're going to insert your hook into the stitch, yarn over, pull up a loop, yarn over, pull through all three loops. Okay, and we're going to do a second half double crochet right here. Yarn over, insert, yarn over, pull up, yarn over, pull through three. And now let's not forget to put a stitch marker into the first of those two stitches. The first sti stitch of the increase gets the stitch marker, okay? And then you just are going to, since we're on the last repeat of that round, we're just working all the way to the end. However many stitches that is. It, it does say in the pattern how many stitches to work, um, just depending on your size. So we're just continuing all half double crochets in this entire round. And then the next round, we're going to be working a little variation on the half double crochet stitch. And that's what gives the brim a little bit of extra stiffness and it makes it look really smooth. It almost looks sort of like knitting sideways or something. A bunch of little V's in columns. I like that stitch because it just looks very neat and tidy. Gives it a little bit of a different texture for the brim, which is kind of fun. Okay, and Brenda's wondering, she's teaching her grandchildren to crochet. Do you think this would be good for beginners? 
I think if you're doing this in something that isn't raffia in a cotton yarn, I think it would be a really good project for beginners uh, because so much of it is single crochet. And when you're working in the round, you know, I don't know why everyone always starts by working in turn rows when they learn first learn how to crochet because working in the round, once you get started, once you set up the very beginning, I feel like that's so much easier because you don't have to monkey around with the turning chain and then knowing where to put your hook. It's so confusing when you're first learning how to crochet, you know, to get, be able to get those rows straight on the edges. I think doing something in single crochet in the round is a really good, um, a really good project for beginner. So yeah, I would say if you can do it in a cotton yarn or something else, um, if you're able to make a substitution, then yeah, definitely. Because just the raffia, it, I think that would be really, I think you have to have a pretty good feel of how to hold the yarn by the, you know, before you try to use raffia because you just don't want another level of frustration. <laughs> all right. So I worked all the way around um, in half double crochet to the end. And so that was just sort of our setup round. So now we can do what's called a half double crochet through the back bar. So this took me a little while to figure out what this back bar business is. <laughs> um, if you look at, here, I'm just going to put a stitch marker in here so I don't lose my loop. If you look at the back of any half double crochet stitch, we're going to just turn it over. There's this extra little loop here. It's a horizontal loop. Here, I'm going to turn this around so you can look at it from this side too. So we're looking, so right now we're looking at the wrong side of this last round, okay? This is the inside. If you look at the top, there's a V. That's where we normally would insert our hook under that, right there, right? From the outside to the inside through that V. But if you look right underneath that V, there is another little line. This creates a V going this way, just be, if you include that part, just below this V. So this gets a little confusing um, when you're first understanding where the back bar is, but if you put your hook or something through there and then look directly underneath it, there's a horizontal bar and that's where you're gonna put your hook. So from the right side, I was just showing you from the wrong side so you can see what the back of that looks like um, a little bit more clearly, but you would be crocheting from this side still because you're still gonna be just working around and around with the right side facing you. And you're doing a regular half double crochet, but you're just working it into that back bar. So because you're working in the round, we'll, we'll, we'll yarn over. And then because we were working in the round, we're inserting our hook from the top to the bottom through that, through that bar. Okay, so in this direction. Okay, don't, don't try to go from the back up or whatever. This, it's a little bit easier to do it from this version or from this vantage point anyway. So you're inserting your hook kind of in a downward motion through that back bar and you're going to yarn over and pull up a loop and yarn over and pull through all three. Okay, we'll do that a couple more times. Yarn over and you're just sort of bending the very top of your stitch toward you so you can see that back bar. This is not to be confused with the back loop, which is right here, but it's even further back than that, okay? Insert in a downward motion, yarn over, pull up a loop, yarn over, pull through three. So what this is doing essentially, because you're working through that back bar, you're actually um, forcing the top loops to flip to the front of your work. So you're looking at when you make this fabric, all these little sort of V's, these sort of chains of V's, those are all the top edge of each of your rounds right there, but they're just flipping to the front because you're stitching through the back. It's just flipping it towards you, basically, is what's happening there. All right, so um, on this first round of half double crochets through the back bar, you're going to be increasing one time between each set of stitch markers. So that just means you're just going to be putting two half double crochets through the back bar into the same back bar once between those stitch markers. So you'll be doing three increases total when you work your way around. So we've already worked a few stitches. I'm gonna put my stitch marker back in to that first stitch. So I don't lose track of that. And you just continue around working in that downward motion through the back bar. And we're gonna do an increase here. So just 
arbitrarily. I just decided to put it here. So we're going to do a, one of the half double crochets through the back bar there. And we're going to yarn over and go into the same back bar. Just like that. So we have those two uh, stitches coming right out of the same stitch. And we are going to be, you know, now before we were only increasing really one stitch per round because it was two stitches on every other round. It was really the total of one stitch per round. Now we're increasing three stitches per round. So that's gonna make our hat brim start to flare out again. It's not as many increases as here where it was going completely out flat, but it is going to start flaring out a little bit of an angle at this point. All right, so uh, you'll just be working the required amount of rounds until you, let's see, until you get to either round 32, 36, 39, or 43. That would be your last round if you're able to follow the pattern uh, line by line here. And then your piece will look about like this. I have actually started doing the very last round, which is a single crochet through the back bar. So it's exactly the same as what we were just doing, the half double crochet through the back bar. Um, except this time it's a single crochet. And the reason that I chose to do that was because as you're working, your half double crochet stitches are kind of long and I thought that it looked weird having all these little horizontal lines and then this longer space here. But I, so I wanted to flip that over and have a shorter little row here so it looked a little bit nicer. So you can see here, I've already worked that single crochet on that very last round right here. So it's a little shorter of a stitch and yeah, you can actually compare them side by side because this is the single crochet work through the back bar and here's half double crochet work through the back bar. So I'll do a, the last few single crochets work through the back bar so you can see what that looks like. And Mariana, she's, uh, she likes the red hat. I do too. That's, that is the one that my daughter Anya picked out but I was kind of hoping <laughs> She'd switch with me, but I don't. Th I think that ship has sailed. I think that's going to be her hat. All right, so we're working single crochets through that back bar, that same back bar. So we're inserting our hook from top to bottom, yarn over, pull up a loop, yarn over, pull through two. Okay. That's the only difference. Is it's it's exactly the same as what we've been doing in the last few rounds. Um, because here, these are all worked the same way, increasing three times around, half double crochets through the back bar, and then the very last round is single crochets through that back bar. So here's my very last stitch. Okay, so Julie is wondering if the corrected PDF will be posted. Yes, it may already have been posted. I am not sure yet. Um, how will you know when it's posted? I, I don't know if you will know, except that uh, you'll just have to take a look at this round, round 12, 13, 14, 15. Just make sure that it says remove the second, third, fifth, and sixth stitch markers. That is the only thing that needed to be corrected on this. So if you already printed it out, um, you know, you could just make a little note on there. Um, or you could, if you have a PDF of it, you could just put a little sticky note on there to remind yourself. But usually they're pretty quick at correcting those things. I'm, just, I'm not exactly sure if it's been corrected yet or not. But if you're watching this at a later date, it likely has already been corrected. But just double check and make sure that that's what it says, because that's what it should say. All right, so I've worked that last single crochet through the back bar, and then I'm just going to do a slip stitch here, and we're gonna fasten off. So um, if you, I'm going to talk about blocking in a minute here, but if you guys have any remaining questions, please get them into the chat box so that I know um, before our time's up. All right, so when you're weaving in your ends, I would recommend using a metal tapestry needle because, again, like the metal crochet hook, I just feel like it's so much easier with something a little bit sturdier because this, there isn't really um, much give here. And because none of my little tricks about splitting yarn or um, my other ways of weaving it ends to make them stay, you, those aren't going to work with this kind of raffia because there aren't 
separate plies in it and it, you can't really, I mean, maybe there are, but you really can't get your needle in there. So you're just gonna have to weave it in back and forth a little bit. It doesn't seem to wanna pop out, but if you are having trouble keeping your yarn tails from, let's see, maybe I can go back up this way. If, you're, if you are having troubles keeping your yarn tails hidden, you could try just a teeny tiny little drop of super glue on the very end of this because normally I wouldn't recommend that um, because I don't know, it just seems like it's going to be a kind of an itchy spot, you know, where that little blob of glue. But if you use a very small amount and you apply it to the end, you know, whatever the end of the, the raffia is touching, because this is on the inside of the brim, that's flaring away from your face. It shouldn't be touching you anywhere. So I don't think it'll be a problem to have that little, a teeny tiny drip of super glue. But I, I didn't do that on, on this version of the hat and I've been wearing it around and it doesn't seem to have popped out. So maybe you don't really need that. But you know, everybody's, people are gonna substitute with different things and you might need a little something to help keep it in place. All right, so we've woven that in. You'll probably have another yarn tail to weave in up here. I already did that earlier. And then um, I did wanna mention, this is a pretty packable hat. I did have this squished in my project bag for a long time and it still looks pretty good. You know, you can kind of pop it back out. You can squish it down like this. So this is kind of nice for if you're gonna, you know, take it somewhere, put it in your suitcase. If it's squished for a very long time, it might start to get a little bit of crease lines and you can just iron those out. So I'm gonna show you how I blocked this hat. If you're using a different fiber, you're probably just gonna wanna do a test to see how you can block it. If it even if it's raffia, especially if it's like that papery raffia, that thin um, kind of flat ribbon that I was showing you guys earlier, you're gonna wanna test it uh, because I don't know, I just don't want you to mess up your project. I only tested it on this particular raffia. So what I did was I just steamed and then ironed. I actually touched the iron to my project, which I almost never ever do. Usually I hover it above with a little bit of steam if I'm blocking it with an iron. But this held up really well to being ironed, surprisingly. I mean, I guess I, it shouldn't really surprise me because I iron paper all the time. Usually when I'm, <laughs> that might sound crazy, but I do a lot of sewing and so I have lots of patterns and envelopes and when I pull them out and they're all wrinkled, I just iron them. So um, obviously you don't wanna go trying that on all of your legal documents. You wanna do a little test first and uh, you, know, you don't wanna burn your house down so don't leave it there. But, oh, I should explain what this is here. Um, but you can iron paper and it works really well to get the wrinkles out. So this is just a large bath towel that I folded into thirds the long way and then I rolled it up. So this is gonna depend, the size you get is gonna depend of course on how big your bath towel was, how big your hat is, so many different variables. But this, was, this worked for most of the hats I was um, blocking in this style. You can roll it a little tighter, roll it a little looser, but you wanna end up with sort of a cake kind of shape and then you can put your hat on top of that. I, I really wanted the top of this hat to be flat because that was just a design choice for me. If you don't want it to be flat, if you wanted it to be rounded, you could round the top of your, you could have your towel wrap up so that the inside kind of sticks up a little higher and as you roll it kind of, um, sort of roll it at an angle so that you get a little bit of a slope there. But I wanted mine to have that sort of flat bucket kind of situation going on there. So you just take your iron and you can just press it right on top. Let's see, might have to reset this a little bit. And then you can use a little bit of steam on it to get it to be nice and flat. There we go. I think my iron safety features kicked in for a little bit there. There we go, now we're getting a little steam. So. You know, like I was saying, you're gonna wanna test this, especially if you used a different type of raffia, because I don't know, I actually did test the other kind of raffia that I have with this and it worked really great, but I just don't wanna be responsible for anybody ruining their, their project. So it gets a little bit, tiny bit sticky at first, it feels like a little bit sticky, and then once it cools off, it has a very nice shape. So you can block the sides of this hat with your towel in it too, if you want, or if you 
have uh, an ironing board with a small enough end on it, you know how your ironing board a lot of times it'll taper down to sort of a point, then you can put your hat on it. Um, I'm going to just use my sleeve board here that I have to show you. You can do this and you can put your iron right on it to sort of even out those stitches and make it look really nice. And I felt like when I first made it, I was like, oh, I don't even know if I need to block this. But then I blocked it and it did look a little bit better. So just kind of shift it and make sure you go all the way around. And then, I, so I'm doing it one, one part at a time because they're different surfaces. You know, first I block the top or you can go back and block that last if you would rather. Um, and then this surface, but I didn't try to block this at the same time. I'm gonna move it out here kind of on the edge of my, arm, of my sleeve board to block this part. And I ended up pulling on this just a little bit when I was blocking it to straighten it out because it kind of got a little wobbly. But it helped it make, look, make it look nice and tidy and nice straight lines where that brim is. Oh, Victoria says she already downloaded it and it's fixed. So thank you, Victoria. Let's see. And Victoria was wondering if I've done with, with a scalloped edge finished, finished, or was a raffia too stiff? No, I think that would be really cute with a scalloped edge, actually. Um, I didn't do one, but now I probably will. <laughs> That'd be really cute. Yeah, you could definitely do a scalloped edge. I don't think the raffia is too stiff to do that. I think it would look really cute. Okay, all right, so this, see how it looks just a little bit tidier after I blocked it? It just looks a little bit more polished. You know, it does, blocking is one of those things that not everyone likes to do, and to be totally honest, I did not block my stuff for years and years and years. I mean, <laughs> I was working as a, you know, making patterns in a professional manner, sending them to magazines and sending in my projects, and some of them were not blocked because I thought they looked just fine which mostly they did. Nobody ever complained and they looked nice, but if you block it, you're kind of taking it to the next level of professionalism and it just looks really nice. So why not do that? I'm a convert. I pretty much block everything now as you know, if I can. So, all right. So it looks like I've answered all the questions hopefully. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. This is a fun tutorial for me to do. And uh, if you guys make this hat, I hope you post pictures on social media because I would love to see them. And um, please join me in a couple of weeks. I'm going to be doing another live tutorial on a, a, a very lacy, well, like a chunky lace kind of cowl. It's going to be really pretty. So please join me for that. Thank you.